Yeah. Well, how you like the show so far? You ain't seen nothing yet. I, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to call Billy Cox my friend, you know. I, I bought all those records. I listened to those things. said, man, who's that cool guy playing with uh, Jimi Hendrix? So I want to just ask Billy a few questions. Hopefully they're questions you would want to ask. Tell us about the first time you heard Jimi Hendrix's guitar. Well, uh, I was coming from a movie. I was about, let me see, I was, he was 18, I was 19, and I was coming from a movie at Port Campbell. And uh, it was raining, I wound up on the doorstep at service club number one, and uh, it was, it, it, the window was up maybe about three inches, and I heard this guitar playing in there. It was in its infancy. And I, the guy next to me, I said, that sounds pretty unique, doesn't it? He wasn't listening with the, he was listening with the human ear. He said, that sounds like a bunch of mess. And I guess it did to the human ear. So I went in, introduced myself, checked out a bass. We formed a band and the rest is history, pretty much history. Yeah, I think you, you told me the other day it was like John Lee Hooker meets Beethoven. Be Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. So when you first started, and so, so you walked in and introduced yourself to Jimmy. Yeah. And said... I play the bass. So I played a little bass in high school, like all you know. A lot, of, a lot of guys played basses and girls played basses. I mean, played instruments in in, in in high school and gave it up. But I, I, I'd really given it up. I just you know was I was in the military now, and that was uh, that's what I was all about. Jumping out of airplanes, perfectly good airplanes. Nothing wrong with them. I'm jumping out of them. Who's a fool, you know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so I entered, told, told him I played a little bass. He said, "Well, check one out." You, at that time, you had you turn in your, your uh, ID card, military ID card, and the service club had all these instruments, every instrument you could think of. At that time, the only bass they had was, I think, was a silver tone or a Dan Electro or something like that. Yeah, well, so you guys were playing around, and you started playing around the uh, service clubs there? Service clubs, and then we branched out to Clarksville, Tennessee. And then he got discharged a month before I did, and we were playing at the Pink Poodle. Uh, so we got a little place there, him, me, uh, our, our, our ladies and him, we just hung, hung there and we worked at the Pink Pool. And one day, these three guys came up and said, look, we own a club here in Nashville on Jefferson Street. We hear you all are pretty good, so we'd like you to come down and audition. So we did come down. We, were, they were close. we didn't play uh, on Sunday and Monday, so we went down that Monday and uh, we uh, auditioned. We played and they said, well, you guys got the job. You can start tomorrow. I said, well, mister, I'm a man of my word, so... We have to give this guy at least a week or two weeks of notice. We give him a week notice and let him know you got to get another man. So we wound up, that's how I wound up in Nashville. Been here ever since. That was in 1962. Yeah. So tell, tell us, how about that? Tell us a little bit about Jefferson Street and Printer's Alley and the scene. What was it like? Well, at that particular time, you could always get a job as a musician because there were probably two clubs on every block in North Nashville. And so house, you know, you, get a, you could always be a house band. And all through, uh, down in, uh, on, on Church Street, there a lot of clubs. This was the club city. Uh, a lot of blues, a lot of country, a lot of pop uh, was here. In fact, this, that's one reason why it's called Music City. We got country, pop, jazz, rock, the whole gambit. And Jimmy Hendrix stated in a, a couple articles, the fact that he really learned to play here in Nashville. This is where he really learned to play. That's right. Because he got all the genres of music. Yeah, and so there was a lot of touring acts that would come through and either you guys would either back them up or open up for them, right? Right, we played behind a lot of them. You know? Yeah, who, so who are some of those acts you guys played behind? Uh, Mitty Collier, uh, Sam Cooke, and Jackie Wilson came in this one club and the band was they were scared to mess with them so we jumped up and just dove right in. Hey, what do you guys want to, you know, so that Sam Cooke turned around and said, dog, oh, these guys, they're pretty brave, ain't they? <laughs> so uh, we played behind them uh, maybe about three or four songs. And, you know, and that, so with that, 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 that was really a, 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 a big time for us. And, and so uh, you told me the other day we were talking, he said, well, Jimmy would, had a way of just sort of leaving and kind of disappearing from time to time. And, and he, you never knew where he was going to call you from. Yeah, he always said, when I make it, I'm going to make it. When I make it. He was determined to do that. But a lot of times he got in with the wrong people like sometimes we do. And uh, he, I'm stranded in St. Louis. Well, 25 bucks, 30 bucks, you can get back here on a, 
on the, on the Greyhound or a Trailways at that time. You can go halfway across the United States for that amount of money in the 60s. So he'd, he'd come back, he'd go out, he'd come back, he'd go out, he'd come back. He did that about seven or eight times. But I remained grounded with the uh, King Casual group. And then I'll always make space for him to come back, you know. And so uh, this one time he called me, he says, Billy said, uh, this guy's going to send me to, uh, to Europe. And he says, he's going to make me a star. And I told him about you. I said, well, Jimmy, I said, some things have happened. I said, I got, I'm renting an amp. I got three strings on my bass, and the fourth one's tied in a square knot. <laughs> he said, man, you here, really? He said, okay. He said, but I'll, I'll make it, and I'll send for you. That's how tight we were. And it took him about three and a half years, but he did. Absolutely. And, and was your, tell me about the first gig you played with Jimmy. First big gig was Woodstock. Good God am I. People as far as the eye can see. As far as the eye can see. Now, in the, in the movie, you'll see the left side of the screen, uh, there weren't a lot of folk, but they had all merged center folk to really, because it, it was really, a, a, they had pushed him more uh, as the man who was going to be at Woodstock, and everybody came to see him, see what we were all about. Yeah. Tell another story. We would come around the back, and when they got to the loft, he took us up, and then you, we could see portions of it, but not everything after we got, because they had the, the fences covered with uh, some type of uh, material. And when we got up to the loft, we opened the curtains, and Mitch looked out, and he says, whoa. And then I wonder what he said. Well, I looked out and said, oh, my Lord. And so Jimmy went out, and he said, mm. But then with his infinite wisdom, he says, what we're going to do, that crowd is sending a lot of energy. So what we'll, take, what we'll do, we'll take that energy, utilize it, and we'll send it back to them. Consequently, we stayed up there almost two hours. So I think it was about an hour and 52 minutes or something. That's almost two hours. Yeah, and boy, you guys put some energy back, let me tell you. <laughs> and, and so it wasn't too long after that that you did the, the Band of Gypsies record live at the Fillmore, right? Live at the Fillmore. And you guys do two nights? Two nights, uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Two shows per day. Oh, uh, man, I tell you what, that's, that's an amazing record. I think it was when the world began to understand that there was more to Jimi Hendrix than just psychedelia. And, and he got back to the roots and he started talking about things that matter to him, like the song Machine Gun. Talk right. a little bit about Machine Gun. Well, first of all, he always said, and you know, musicians, a lot of professional musicians out here, and you know this for a fact, he said that if you're in a band and everybody likes everybody and gets along, the music's going to reflect that. But you got one uh, AH in the band that causes problems all the time, you need to get rid of him because he's going to destroy the music. It's going to be a problem somewhere. So fortunately, we were all friends, and we got along, and we had fun. Uh, Machine Gun was supposed to have been just a little uh, something like a Hear My Train, but it turned into an incredible song. Uh, and uh, it, 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 that, and along with The Power of Soul, were, were very most, probably the most dynamic songs that he, he had created. But I think, you know, it, it was that social awareness of what other people were going through that made Machine Gun such a powerful statement. Yeah, with the Vietnam War was in full force at that particular time, unfortunately. And uh, he was uh, giving a little of his wisdom uh, about that and what it was all about. And incredibly, he could take that guitar and make the sound of a machine gun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we don't have a whole lot of time because we want to get back to the music. I, I got one question. I, I've been hearing the last few days, I've been hearing a rumor that that white Stratocaster that Jimmy played at Woodstock was actually bought from Cotton Music. Is that a true story? No, it right, wasn't. Right here in Nashville. Uh, no, he had gotten rid of that. But he did take one that I had signed for. and uh, He left you with the bill? He left me with the bill. But I told him about it, and he gave me eight $100 bills. I don't, my bill was only three. <laughs> well, that's, my that's, game on that. that's great, man. And it's such an honor to, to have you here opening the first NAM show at the new convention center here, Music City. I'm, I'm we so, love you, Nashville. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of Billy Cox as a, li a life member of our local here, uh, AFM Local 257. And, and it just, you know, every time I look through our directory and I pass through the seas, I just sort of stop and look at Billy's name and go, yeah. <laughs> so anyway i just want to thank you billy for bringing your guys from all over you put together an amazing group we got a few guests and uh I, I want you to tell us a little bit about your your next guest billy thoden he's pretty unusual 
Billy Foden's father was, was very concerned about this young man. Right now, he just turned 12 years old. He can play a guitar. When I was 12, I couldn't play, couldn't pick nothing. But anyway, uh, I first uh, got introduced to him. We were on the tour bus doing the Experience Hendrix Tours, and we were in, uh, I think, New Jersey. This guy walked up and handed us a CD, and a well, DVD. Uh, and so we all took one, me and Kenny Wayne Shepherd and a few other guys. And we got on the tour bus, took off, went our... I said, did anybody look to see about this kid? He said, no, they, this guy gave it to me. I said, well, let's play it in the, in, the, on the, in, the, in the DVD player. We played it, and I was impressed with this nine-year-old kid. Well, he's been down here since then, and we helped him produce the CD, and he's not signed. He's not signed, and so he's going to come out with his father on bass. In fact, they played with us on our tour in uh, New York at the winery. And he's played with us at the Iridium in, in New York and a few other uh, clubs. So we get the stage to, we call him Billy the Kid, Billy Thornton, thank 12 you. years old. All right. Thank you, Billy Cox. Billy Cox, everybody.